podcast, We'll Act for Change, where we discuss the relationship between advocacy and activism in theater and film arts. I am your host, Kat Kemet, and today I am joined by the wonderful Casey Cole. Casey is an actress, singer, and cosplayer based in Kentucky. She is a compelling storyteller who seems to be able to take on it all, film or theater, comedy or drama, classical or contemporary works. Casey has most recently been involved in a touring show called The History of Now at the Commonwealth Theater Center based in Louisville, Kentucky, and in Wildcat, a Flannery O'Connor biopic directed by Ethan Hawke. Casey has continuously astonished and impressed everyone around her with her incredible passion, drive, knowledge, and talent. Casey, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for that intro. (laughs) Hey. Now, Casey, the play you are currently starring in, The History of Now, tackles the subject of book banning in a high school. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience working on this play? Yes, absolutely. Um, So The History of Now is part of the Commonwealth Theater Center's touring series, outreach series. Um, They have quite a few um, throughout the year. Um, and we go to schools and we talk about particular subjects. Um, and Keith McGill, he's got a penchant for writing about the controversial. Um, and it's on purpose. Um, and he, he wants to make sure that he broaches these subjects in a way that is one accessible, but also to um, applicable to a kid's life, you know, mm-hmm. um, and history of now literally talks about how you can make history today by doing whatever you need to do. Uh, There's a beautiful quote in it, um, which is people don't go around looking for historical moments. They have ordinary moments and they do what they can with them. They do something about it, you know? And um, that's that's how it's been working on this whole experience because we've all also kind of, we also kind of co-wrote this together. Like it was a work in progress and we edited it together um, and we had just the experience and the knowledge. There's a, there's a lot, a wealth of knowledge in between this cast um, and just talking about like who impacted what, where, and we have to kind of know about who we're talking about if we're going to tell these kids who we're talking about. So I learn more with Keith's shows like every every time I do them. Um, we had another show called No Turning Back last year um, and that was about... Um, uh, anywhere from enslavement all the way to civil rights in Kentucky, um, in Louisville, Kentucky specifically. Um, and we had many, many vignettes and we talked about those as well. So Keith pulls out the little known histories and wants to make them highlighted and, and shine brighter um, through young minds. That's amazing. How do the themes like in that play, um, History of Now and the one you did previously, how do those reflect your own values and concerns as an artist? Yeah, um, I I mean, I want everybody to know their history, but I especially want to know Black history. And from living in Florida, I'll say it, I didn't know a lot of Floridian Black history. I really don't. It's not taught a lot. Um, and uh, when most of the things I was taught, it was taught at home. My mom would be the one during Black History Month telling me, hey, go learn something new today. Um, mm. And the fact that we're able to bring this to kids and and show them that not only black history because we talk about latino history we talk about white history we talk about all of it and how people can be advocates um or they can be against the cause like it really you you choose where you lie in this situation um and you know you have that power and what i love most about um keith shows is that they empower kids all Mm -hmm. the time they empower kids to go look up that thing or to go and see how this person changed history in their own way. Go see what you can do in your community. Um, and I I love empowering kids. I love being there for the betterment of children um, and for the youth because like they're all we've got. Like <laughs> they're really all we've got to continue. You know what we what we hope to is to hope to be the progression of our country. Right. I mean, they're the future. Mm-hmm. Um, Literally. <laughs> what do you hope that audiences leave with when they see the show um I think a better understanding of what they can do for mm-hmm. yeah a better understanding what they can do for their communities um and realizing that literature is subjective yeah things get banned for particular reasons I know that um there were some books that got banned when I was in 
in the schools, but what I loved about it, and I went to a Catholic school, is that they never explicitly told us that, like, this is banned for a particular reason. They just said, you can read it yourself and see, you know, what what it's about. But, um, you know, I, I, I would prefer that hopefully they can see that the restricting of knowledge is never um, is never a good thing. Right. And so, yeah, make it accessible. Make it something that you can choose to like or not like. Yep. And do you feel that this subject is particularly relevant today? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, Amanda Gorman's book, uh, which is the subject of the um, of the play, got banned <laughs> almost quite literally after she read it for Biden's inauguration, um, very quickly afterwards. Uh, and, you know, there's a if you in the show itself, there's a list of banned books that we talk about and you, you kind of can't believe it. But I will say this, even though Florida is kind of the hotbed of that kind of issue recently, um, there's bookstores everywhere that are still celebrating the diversity of books and what they can and what knowledge they can give you. There's a whole uh, bookstore in in Mount Dora that straight up says like banned books in the, in the window and they talk about them. And I saw one in that was in the play. And I'm like, yeah, I know where that one's banned. And it's a ridiculous reason. Um, it's, it's so it's, funny you mentioned that because I actually was at that bookstore today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I know you and I know exactly which one downtown Mount Dora. Yep. Barrel of yep. books and games. Yes. Yes. We passed it. And I was like, I know exactly that book. Oh my gosh. And I know why it's banned and I know what it's about. But, you know, I think that things being banned kind of um, gained this interest about, about it, you know, this mm-hmm. taboo interest about like, what was it so bad about? And then you might realize, oh, it was bad, or maybe it wasn't, <laughs> you yeah. know, again, it, it's subjective. I think that learning is very much subjective and you can come out with a different conclusion of many different things. There are some books that I don't enjoy still today <laughs> yep. that are required reading. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, this show in particular is a musical. How do you mm-hmm. feel music helps tell the story? <laughs> um, so I would say musical is very, very loose. Um, okay. we do we do like rap. We uh and it's fun. Um and I think that kids learn through music even more nowadays than they used mm-hmm. to. Um, and it's just an accessible format. And um, I think it helps push along the story because we take Shakespeare, for example, and then we take like modern day rap and we mix them together, just like Lynn Manuel Miranda does. Um, and we add in our own flu- our own context and basically say like, hey, these things this year came from this or uh, back and forth. And I, the one thing that I wish I could have is the kids ask questions because I have so much information about how Shakespeare influenced hip hop and how hip hop now is influenced by this, that, and the other thing. Like, I, I just hope that they learn more music history from it. That's all I'm mm. hoping. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want I want to switch gears here. I would love to ask more about that, but I, I'm sure. very <laughs> aware that we're limited on, on time. So um, I'm going to switch gears and discuss your experience working on the film Wildcat. Did mm-hmm. the project itself change or influence your understanding of Flannery O'Connor and her work? Yes, um, because truthfully, uh, I <laughs> I have a roommate who is older than me um, by a couple decades. And he, when I mentioned the name Flannery O'Connor, he said, oh yeah, Flannery O'Connor. And I'm like, great. I'm glad you know who that is because I don't. <laughs> um, I have no idea who that is. Um, so, you know, to start there, yes, I gained a huge understanding of who she was and, and what she set out to do, um, which wasn't super large I think she like really flourished in modesty you know um especially with a Christian upbringing um and wasn't like actively trying to change the world she was just talking about the world around her right yeah I would say it's very much similar to Zora Neale Hurston's work um Mm. which um she was basically like the like the godmother of social anthropology through writing yeah yeah 
-hmm. Now, O'Connor's work, um, it was filled with flawed characters that deal with oftentimes steep moral conflicts. And they're usually set in the South. How did your experience living in the South shape your view of the world? And were you able to pull from your experiences in your role in Wildcat? I think so. I would say that my part of Florida was an, a weird part of the South because a lot of people don't consider Florida the South, but there are some parts of Florida that are the South. Um, yep. And especially in Central Florida. Um, you wouldn't know it, but yes, yes, they are there. Um, I think that Flannery's concept of religion, um, for some reason, it, it even though it was very strictly this is very strictly Christian and, and she quotes the Bible and she talks exactly about how she, you know, in, interprets it as well. Um, it somewhat reminds me of like Alice Walker, um, how Alice Walker had this hugely different interpretation of God and um, and what it meant to her and what it meant to her characters in Color Purple. Um, and I, I feel that with, um, with Flannery O'Connor as well, trying to take the immoral and take the complicated circumstance of humanity and put it into writing in a way that haunts you. I think mm. that really was her goal was to haunt you, was to let you know that, hey, yes, you're a morally complicated spirit and you're not the moral end all be all either. Just because you're Christian, just because you're white in the South, that doesn't mean you're right all the time. It doesn't mean that you you know have a moral standing in comparison to um in comparison to black folk there in comparison to latina folk there so um i i found a really huge understanding in flannery's work and you know when maya was reading it i had to sit there and realize i'd never heard these words before um when i was on set and just hearing her read it multiple times because we took multiple takes but hearing her read it um, over and over, I, like, there was a point where I really, really got into it, and I'm like, that's God. That's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You're talking about God right there. Because <laughs> um, it doesn't become apparent until it becomes apparent. Um, and I can still remember my first time hearing and understanding that, at least that about her work. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, now, how have your lived experiences helped to shape your relationship to the roles you play in in this or in theater and film in general? Right, you did ask that question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, again, um, as a black woman in the South, um, I would say that my experiences, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to grow up in some place that wasn't really super prejudiced or didn't inflict that on me a whole bunch. I was lucky enough to have that privilege and to be in like a private school for a while. Um, but I also could easily see like hypocrisy of people that said that, you know, I'm good for this particular program or I'm smart enough for this particular program, but somebody else isn't. Somebody else that has my skin color is not, you know, does not deserve this for this, that, and the other reason. I like my life and being able to see the flaws in others, I think, and to understand them and to really think like, hey, you know, have an empathetic lens about it because black women are, are kind of asked to be empathetic on a really uh, on a really frequent basis not specific basis on a frequent basis because a lot of people don't have our same experiences um mm -hmm. but it makes it feel specific when like for example when ethan hogg asks you hey how does this how does this script that i have helped write how does that help you like how, do, how does that inform your experience or does your experience say that this is wrong like what I what I have said for your character to be wrong um and I think that we just had that we had that conversation and for future works and for past works I'll always have that conversation with myself about like do you think this person that you're playing is correct do you think that this person that you're playing is you know are they are they close to you? Are they far away from you? And if they are, how? You know, because um, I could play a white lady in Minnesota if I really wanted to, but you have to be able to ask the question about how someone connects to you and in what way, where are the connections? 
or else you'll never get the character. You'll never see how they could be possibly right. And I feel like if you, even if you play somebody that opposes you completely mm -hmm. um, politically, I think you still need to have that empathy. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And so as a Black woman, I, I really think that that is um, something that I'm asked to have on a daily basis. Um, and especially if someone says something egregious, you know, the, you have to have empathy about it or you have to forgive them for something that you think is unforgivable, but, you know, you have to live in their world for just a moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it helps. Yeah, there's a lot of gravity into it. And I, I, I would love to discuss more um, when you're asked to empathize with people who otherwise did in, in something that would otherwise be considered unforgivable, um, how that has strengthened you in your work as an artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, just how how that has strengthened my work as an artist is learning how to forgive and realize that they they have this circumstance and they can't help that sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's some things that you can absolutely help that you shouldn't be able to say them certain things, but like, you know, it, you're already judging yourself for saying that certain thing. <laughs> yeah, my judgment will impact you, sure, but me knowing that uh, my judgment will impact you is enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of all that, that's kind of what we talked about, uh, Maya and I, um, when talking about Flannery O'Connor, because she used like derogatory language. She used the N word, hard R, in uh, in her works. Um, but it was to tell the story of the world around her and she would be false in saying that, you know, they softened their words, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, because they didn't. They did not in 1950s Georgia. No, they did not. So, yeah. Now, this is kind of an odd shift, but um, turning this into a lighter avenue. Um, in 2017, you played Rachel Yorick in a oh. vlog style web series called Hamlet the Dame. This um, was a retelling of the classics tale by Shakespeare, but it dealt with LGBT plus issues, mental health, and of course, as in with Shakespeare's Hamlet, themes of death and dying. You also more recently played Hermia in a queer Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Could you tell us a little bit about your roles in those projects? Yes. Um... Well, that web series was my first web series. It was my first, a, a lot of things. I think it was probably my second time being on camera, like ever. Um, and shout out to that because it, it was really fun just kind of being in um, a space where one, the premises were doing Shakespeare, two, the Shakespeare is queer, and three, it has to do with like very emo Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> we just made Hamlet emo and call it a day. Uh, like there's a bunch of work around and a bunch of writings around who Hamlet is and what he is, and we're just like he's just an emo boy from <laughs> from Central Florida, um, and that's you know plenty to be emo about. Um, oddly enough, I think there's just joy in um, a lot of Shakespeare today, no matter which one you do, if you do a tragedy, comedy, or history, just because of the fact that the stakes today are absolutely as high as they were in Shakespeare's time, but they just don't feel like it. They just don't feel like it. And you get to work with heightened circumstance um, all around, and you kind of bring yourself to be more heightened. I didn't work with language as much in Hamlet the Dame because um, we modernized it, but mm -hmm. in Midsummer Night's Dream, we did work with the original language. And... Um, it's this is this was actually my first Shakespeare that I did on stage like in a stage setting um and I've, I've done like a lot of Shakespeare work mm -hmm. and a lot of Shakespeare scene study um but I've not done like a full Shakespeare play and this was my first time and I was terrified and it was so fun um because being in a space that is saying, hey, we're going to take this text from 400, 500 years ago, and we're going to not modernize it, but make it applicable to modern audiences kind of already makes it even funnier than it already is. Because you're you're not going to hear someone just say 
random Shakespeare lines unless you're around a bunch of theater kids. <laughs> and then you will. Or yep. my mom. She loves it. <laughs> she is a Shakespeare nerd. She started this. This whole thing is her fault. Um, and I... I mean, I found it to be a free space. So you're already in ridiculous circumstances. Acting is, you know, acting with acting, acting is being within certain circumstances and you're in ridiculous circumstances. You're making something that was not originally LGBTQ, LGBTQ, but that's because Shakespeare didn't know what that was. <laughs> he had no idea what that was. So it doesn't matter. And it gave, it gave context to the show that, wasn't there before and may never be again because of the specific way we did it but I love that because I think that I don't think that Shakespeare would care how his plays are getting continued so long as they are getting continued the fact that we're talking about this man 500 plus years later is um you know or 400 500 um but yeah the fact that we're talking about this man centuries later centuries later is i think he doesn't care he wouldn't care how this was interpreted he he would he would care about do you enjoy doing the show was it well received um and you know did you connect to the work and yes mm -hmm. on all three um i think modernizing shakespeare is just like how how we have half our works today anyway yeah so it doesn't matter how it gets done so long as it gets done and um, I hope to work with this troupe more in the future. They've got more on the docket. So, you know, go and check them out. It's Three Witches Shakespeare. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm a huge Shakespeare nerd as well. So anytime that there's an opportunity for a new audience to be exposed to Shakespeare's work or to bring people closer to that, absolutely resounding yes, bring people together with this historical text that you can modernize in so many different ways right um you were also in lynn nottage's incredible play sweat and even though this play was written in the mid 2010s and is set in the early 2000s it deals with themes that are also still very current and relevant and we talked a little bit before we started recording of our mutual love of lynn nottage because yes. she's just an icon um, could you share a bit of your experience working on that play? Yes. Um, I loved it. Uh, I actually did not audition for it originally because, um, that, uh, the director is one of my good friends. Um, but I was like, you need an older person to play this role because Cynthia is in her, is in her late forties, I believe. Um, and, or early fifties. And I'm like, you need another person to play this role. <laughs> um, but he's like, honestly unless I put out another round of auditions it's you 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 have to do it and I'm like ah okay <laughs> um so I felt honestly like a fish out of water because I'm sitting here like I have to play somebody that's two decades older than me um at least um but oh also Lynn Nottage writes a challenging show she writes a challenging show because um she writes it like real life people yeah. cut each other off you know, there's there's not complete sentences all the way through. Um, people do like little references. They sing, they dance. You know, it. That's a difficult play to write. Is mm -hmm. real life, and um, she does it so well that if I can really quick segue, the first time I saw Sweat, um, I saw it in Chicago, and I. I, I thought we were doing some kind of pre-show and they were halfway into scene one and <laughs> because I thought they were just talking, you know, they, they, they made themselves so themselves, even yeah. if that's not even close to them, like as, as actors. Um, but they made themselves so natural in that work. Um, and so I already had a huge impression on sweat when I first read it, when I first saw it, um I was like oh please let me do this justice <laughs> <laughs> um but I would say that probably the easiest way for me to do this justice was to thankfully think of my mom who was named Cynthia um yeah lucky me <laughs> oh wow <laughs> um, talk about serendipitous 
It was completely serendipitous. Um, I found it funny when I first started reading that show because I was like, oh, look, it's my mom. Because um, <laughs> they, it sounds, she sounds almost the exact same. Um, oh. and yeah, I could just hear her voice on the page um, multiple times over. And so I was blessed with that because I'm like, oh, I get to just, I get to use my mom's real life. And I'll tell you, she is a monologue artist. That woman can give a monologue about how her day was after work. Um, and I swear I learned from her. So I, I swear it was it was easy once I figured out, you know, I didn't want it to be too much like my mother because it was just an easy pass. But I'm like, you know what? It is. This is my mom. This is my mom. This is a lot of hardworking Black women in America. Mm -hmm. Um and this is their experience. So it, it has to be my mom. It has to be my aunts. It has to be, you know, my, my grandmother. Um, so I, I loved that show with all my heart. I feel like I put so much into it um, and got so much out of it because I mm -hmm. stopped thinking about, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. No, no, I'm just going to have to do it. I got cast. <laughs> what went through your mind when you first read the script? That's a funny question because uh, I read that script probably five, ten years before I ever performed it. Um, and I thought that, first of all, yeah, they got what they deserved, if you know what I'm talking about, if you've read Sweat. Um, but also, wow, look at the human condition and how, um, look at how we can see America in a bit of a bottle. Mm. Kind of, yeah like a, this is a message in a bottle to america hello um the, we have already ended up like this this is not how we're going to end up this is not a warning shot this is how we are right now yeah. um this is how and you know it's difficult to do that based off of a real place because they might think is this how we are right now but some of them know that answer and some of them know that answer is yes. <laughs> um, and how do we change it? How do we, mm -hmm. you know, how, and maybe not even how do we change it, but, you know, I, I'll tell you, remember what we talked about. I had somebody that, that voted for Trump in that audience watching me. Um, and I remember they came out and uh, we came out, the cast came out afterwards and they congratulated me and said, you did amazing you captured like my hometown you captured you know people that I know and that's all I wanted to hear like I mean I don't really do this to want to hear something but I was like wow yeah this even 10-15 years later this the show is still one of the most produced in the country um for a solid reason because it is yeah. every smaller town in america and people that come from small towns and go into big towns or big cities they won't forget that they won't forget that sentiment and people that stayed there you know they also won't forget that sentiment they realize that they might have been on one side of this or the other and you know since then changed opinion or maybe they didn't but it touched them it yeah. was yeah it's Gosh, I could, I, I'll gush about Lynn Nottage all day, but she managed to get the human experience in like two and a half hours. And that is a feat. <laughs> wow. And it's such a specific and beautiful experience too. The the way that the, the characters shifted over the course of that play, mm -hmm. it was so brutally honest and sympathetic and critical, but not in a like a judgmental way. It was the... Oh, oh she my God. wrote people she wrote people um yeah and it, it felt honest the the first time reading sweat feels feels so I, I i don't know if there's anyone that i've ever met that's read that play that has come away with like eh. it's just so impactful mm -hmm. in in such a deep way um right yeah oh, God. i love Lynn i don't know if you saw clyde's i did um, i have oh. I have. They did it in Cincinnati, um, and so I saw it. I oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Oh my god, 
Yeah, uh, it, when it clicked in my head that one of the characters was the same character from Sweat, I was like, yes. yes, I read it and I was like, that's so funny. Why do you have that same character's name in there? And then I was, I, I saw it and I'm like, oh, oh, no, no, no. It actually is him. I get it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, kind of calling back to your mention previously about how, um, Black women are called to be more empathetic. It felt it felt that way. It the the amount of overwhelming empathy and willingness to kind of peruse all viewpoints and look at them in a human, honest way mm-hmm. in all of her works is just so stunning. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think she gives that and I what I love that about that is that she gives that credence to everybody she yeah. gives that to everybody it's not she writes ensemble pieces about the fabric of the country about the fabric of the place that she is writing about because she's written about Africa as well um and you know she's written for stuff back in time she's written you know modern etc um and she doesn't have any villains she yeah. takes very good care to not have any villains. Everybody, like you might perceive somebody as a villain for sure, but again, she's just taking whether it's interviews or um, you know things that she's heard people say. She's just taking the people's words. Yeah, you know, you can interpret them however you want to, but this is what they said, and this is this is what they stand on. You know, yeah. Um, so she doesn't have villains she makes people just see life how it is and keep it moving you know yeah yeah she 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 is yeah that's something that i think is so impressive with her work is she she trusts the audience to get it and she trusts that people will recognize their own fallibility in characters when they do behave in ways that would be are moments of villainy but at their core they're just they're just humans that are flawed they're surviving yeah they're simply surviving uh like you can consider it villainy all you want but if they're alive at the end of the day that's what that character cares about because that's what that's what we care about yeah that is what we care are we alive are we well fed are my people taken care of that's what we care about yeah you know and that's what she writes about it's it's never any indictment on somebody um even if it yeah. feels like it is but that's because you're feeling something yeah that's it. now on that note um theater making you feel something mm. how do you feel ad- advocacy and activism and theater and film intertwine i think it oh gosh i think that you have life first obviously um and then you have a cause whether you know you believe in it completely fully or you want to critique it um and then you have words and then you have action um Mm. and these things flow into art in the same exact way um because you know you get the inspiration um if i may ethan hawk was telling you about how he found inspiration you know through his searching in religion um Mm -hmm. to to you know get this flannery o'connor project off the ground um i currently hopefully have something that i'm thinking of because i live it and then i'm like okay maybe write it down but make it abstract or something and then we can put it up or maybe we don't like i feel like art gets to a certain point um, but you have to live it first, or you have to experience it, or you have to find it so interesting that you you realize you want to live it, or you know you want to see it up here. So the cause comes first, me- meaning life comes first, um, and then one comes after the other, after the other, after the other. So yeah, especially here in Louisville, we do that a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Now, as an artist how do you strike the balance between the 
gravity of activism with the the freedom of play that acting necessitates mm-hmm. oh, this is a good one that's a good question um <laughs> you know what i actually know exactly how to answer this i just realized okay um my friend um simi edwards she's great she composed uh we basically all um made a play we uh, devised a play um in the midst of 2020 and everything um including the repeated Breonna Taylor protests etc cetera, etc cetera. and we just kind of talked about um the amount of especially in black culture you have to laugh in order not to cry mm. um because of how just like sometimes ridiculous people can be it's not just like how racism can be cruel and stuff it's just like also how can it be ridiculous because it is <laughs> and um so we we kind of already have to have that it's it's kind of ingrained in a lot of how people play um and you know to kind of play with this I've said it a while ago that I'm like oh you know what um black people play a little bit differently and I say this in the sense that I have accidentally hurt some feelings because I just did a standard roast and I was like oh no I'm so sorry this meant to be just like a funny little joke I'm so sorry and you know I never mean any harm by it but I'm like oh wait I've had to have this thicker skin whole time and I never mean any offense by you know uh, like if I mean offense then you will know when I mean offense um but when we play around I realize I'm like oh we're kind of harder on ourselves sometimes um than like an average person might be um and so I realized that 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 play has already gone into my acting many times is that you have to laugh to keep from crying um, or from lamenting too much and thinking too hard over how much in the world um, cannot be remedied by uh, by just lamenting over it. Uh, mm-hmm. So you have to find the cheer and you have to find the good. Like Mr. Rogers said, find the helpers, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and realizing how you can help yourself with this so it it doesn't have to be that the burden's all on you um Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be super heavy all the damn time um even if you are trying to advocate for world peace um prime example for me currently is um you know watching what goes on in let's say the congo etc um there's people dancing and then there's people mining for coal time which by the way Lenadish also writes about um and <laughs> if you go and read ruined there's plenty of jokes there's plenty of fun times there's songs yeah. um and there's there's a lot of heightened beauty and goodness and innocence and then there's devastating loss you know yeah um and so i think living it you kind of get to work in between that and you can find that in, in a lot of disadvantage. You can find that with poor people in general. They got to make do. They have to make do. And, you know, you can have a, you can ball on a budget and and that budget can be really tight, but they, they make do and they, they have fun with it, you know, um, like economic status be damned. So <laughs> it's a matter of, again, living to find your method. Yeah. Now, on that note of of looking for lightness, looking for that other side to the devastation, when you're working on film, TV, and theater, what is it that you that you hope for in the future of those mediums? Mm-hmm. Um, I hope for more nuance. I we're we're getting there we're getting we're getting further and further like to this point of you know realizing that lived experiences will not just match what's on a script every time um and having that nuance it it colors the whole thing it makes it a more beautiful production when you allow that nuance to shine through as opposed to what your predisposed thought is of this character 
Um, so I always love it when we're in an interactive space mm -hmm. and it's not just the director saying like, this is what you have to do. You have to get it done this way, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and I've been blessed to have like a whole bunch of collaborative spaces in the last year, which made me really refine how I feel about collaboration. Cause I feel like if I'm not in a collaborative space, I'm going to make it collaborative somehow. Like we're going to give and take here. Um, there's, there's no one end all be all way for someone to be somebody. Um, and you will have two different people reading the same script and have two different interpretations of one line. Um, and multiply that by all the rest of the lines and you, you could come out with two separate people entirely. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, finding that nuance and, and people realizing that it, it has to be a collaborative space uh is is what i want more of yeah awesome now when you're on the other side of things when you're in the audience mm -hmm. what resonates most with you mm. oh, i haven't been an audience member in a minute no uh i <laughs> i have. um i miss i miss being in the audience sometimes i'm like let me see something fresh and you know just not have to worry about it um, so I think what most resonates with me is kind of the audience collaboration or thought of like, what's happening next? Like, I think that we, as an audience are all rooting for that person to win or whatever, a cast member or whoever. Um, and I, I love seeing that just play out. And I also love the, um, the innocence of just going in to stuff. I've stopped watching mm -hmm. a lot of trailers now for films um, because I just want to go in. I want to go in and I want to see it. If I already had an interest in it, then I don't need the trailer. Um, so I'm like, yeah, let me just go in and yeah. and experience it fully, you know? So that's, that's one of my favorite parts of being an audience member is that excitement that everybody kind of gets. Um, when they're like, oh, this is new. We're going to see something for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe never again. Like that play may never happen again. Um, so it's kind of the um, exclusive experience of it. Yeah. And you're in it together. I mean, everyone in that audience, you have that kind of shared mm -hmm. experience where, I mean, if you're crying together or if you're laughing together, there's some sort of bond that I, I feel like kind of happens with an audience. Right. And that's what I love about live theater, because even if the actor messes up, then like you, it's between you and this audience. It's not yep. between like the entire world. Um, <laughs> and unless like it's a live theatrical broadcast on like NBC or something. But even then, yeah. that's still you and this audience. And in five years, nobody's going to remember that. Like, yeah, unless it's like a really big mess up. <laughs> um. Or there's but, a critic in the audience who's reporting on it, and then you're like, oh, exactly, yeah, one of those. But yeah, you know, like I, I still remember when I'm, I remember almost every single time I've messed up on a stage, and you know what? How many times has that impacted me? Zero, <laughs> zero times. I, you know, you keep booking, you just keep going, and you remember those mistakes, and you laugh about them, or you, you know, you dread them ever happening again, and they yeah. probably don't. They probably don't because they've happened the <laughs> one time, and it's out the way. Now, are there any parting thoughts you would like to leave us with? God, have fun in this world, please, while we can. Please don't work too hard, even in this in, in this little whole uh, this acting sphere that we've got. Please don't work too hard. Remember your peoples. Give your people flowers, um, and 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 rest every so often please every so often every so often we gotta hustle we gotta be out here we really do if you want to get you know the gospel of you out there but please rest and go clip some coupons inflation's crazy <laughs> awesome well thank you so much for joining us casey it was great to have you on the show thank you so much for asking me i love this <laughs>